Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Focus for Wednesday, October the 18th, 2023, at 12.30 p.m. Central Time. Well, today's Focus, something you've probably heard a lot of talking, uh, a lot of discussions, a lot of sermons about, and that is Revival. I want to talk today about revival because I don't know, at least in your Christian life, I can't speak for you, but for my, for me in my Christian life, it just seems that there's always a constant discussion about revival. And and what I mean by that is this, there'll be either a talk about the revivals of the past that will happen sometimes, but most of the time, whenever things are going bad in the country, when things are going bad in the church. When things may be going bad in someone's spiritual life, there will be this idea that what we need is revival. Pastors will sometimes tell their church, we need revival. Our country needs revival. We need revival. Now, I think there was a time it was talked about far more than maybe it is today. I think there was a time there was constant discussion about revival. We need to pray for revival. We need to, there needs to be a revival. But even today, even though it may not get the same amount of time dedicated to it, sooner or later, if, you, if you're listening to Christians talk, when they start talking about the condition of the world or the condition of the church, they'll say, pray for revival. We need revival. The only thing that's going to save this country is revival. So they may not go into much detail about it. There may not be much teaching about it, but it's still mentioned. So I, I do want to try to draw a distinction. I think there was more teaching about it in the past. I think there was more pursuing of it in the past. In the present, I don't know if there is much teaching about it. I don't know. I, but, well, I mean, there's still a lot of discussion about it. But some things that have happened on some college campuses got the whole world talking about revival. So, um, but I, I, so maybe there are still people pursuing it. I just felt that it was more common in the past. Maybe my perception is wrong now that I'm thinking about it. Maybe it's just as much discussed today as it was in the past. You can draw that determination. It probably depends on what you're listening to and where, where you are around. I guess there's always been certain elements of Christianity, certain branches of Christianity, certain segments of Christianity, where the concept of revival is constantly discussed and pursued and taught. And maybe there are other elements and segments of Christianity where it's mentioned, but it may not be as talked about and pursued as much as others. But let's talk about revival. Now, if we define revival, we may get a a number of different definitions. I just pulled up one. Let's just look up. We'll look at two different things here. All right. The first one is this, all right? This comes from uh, a, a, an article called The Old Testament Concept of Revival within, I think, new. I, I don't have the entire title of it, within the New Testament or something along those lines, all right? But here we go. Revival means making alive again those who have been alive but have fallen into what is called a cold or dead state, Stop right there. If revival is those who have been alive, but have fallen into what is called a cold or dead state, when, whenever we say our country needs revival, I don't ever quite understand that, right? Because, because like, it's not like the country was once spiritually, uh, like, like, I don't, the, the country just seems like an odd thing, right? Because most of the country, no matter how much we want to say was Christian, I don't think has ever been truly born again, regenerate Christians. I, I don't know if that would be even fair to say. I think there has been a, there was at one point, there was very much a strong cultural Christianity, a strong cultural influence from Christianity. But to say revive would be like, well, there was all, the whole country was at one t- at one point alive, but they fall into what is now a cold or dead state. In fact, this definition goes on to say they are Christians and have life, but they need reviving to bring them back to their first love and the healthy growth of the spiritual life to which conversion was meant to be. And then they, they go on from there. But you get the basic idea. Revival means making alive again those who have been alive but have fallen into what is called a cold or dead state. 
So when we say the country, I don't really quite understand how we're using that terminology. You could say the church, Christians within this country, they need to be revived. Because if the Christians within this country were revived, that would have a a profound impact upon the nation. Because more people that are, if the Christians are revived, then they will be growing. They will be demonstrating love even to their enemies. And they will be demonstrating maybe the fruit of the spirit. They'll be growing spiritually. There'll be some something positive seen there. That's typically the way it is presented. So I don't know so much about the country needs revival as the Christians within the country needs revival, or a better thing to say is the church within America needs revival. I think that is a better way of understanding. I know a lot of people can, when they focus on revival, they focus on on sinners becoming converted, that the country needs revival. And what they mean by that is that people need to be come to Christ. They need repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. They're, they're looking at it as a mass period of conversion where the lost are saved. This definition approaches it from a different perspective. Let me read it to you again. Revival means making alive again those who have been alive, but have fallen into what is called a cold or dead state. They are Christians and have life, but they need a need reviving to bring them back to their first love and to healthy growth of the spiritual life. Now, I, I, I don't know which way you understand revival. If you understand it as mass conversion, then I guess you could say America needs to revival because we need everyone in America to become saved. If you understand revival to be referring to believers who have fallen into kind of a spiritual coldness, a, a spiritual deadness, they're not truly spiritually dead like someone who has lost, but a, a spiritual apathy, a spiritual complacency, a spiritual just not, they're not, they're not, they don't care about the things of God. There, there's something just not right there. They're not healthy, spiritually speaking. They need to be revived. Another source defines revival this way. Revival refers to a spiritual awakening. Oh, I'm sorry. Revival refers to a spiritual reawakening from a state of dormancy, dormancy or stagnation in the life of a believer. Please note, it's a reawakening. It's people who were awake and now they, they found themselves dormancy. They, they, they're, they, they found themselves in a dormant state, a stagnant state. They're stagnated. They're dormant. They're apathetic. They're complacent. They don't don't care. They just kind of shrug their shoulders and like, whatever. Or they don't even really give it much thought or consideration of where they are spiritually. They're focused on this or they're pursuing this or they're after this. And and the things of God kind of, they've grown cold too. It encompasses the resurfacing of a love for God, an appreciation of God's holiness, a passion for his word and his church, a convicting awareness of personal and corporate sin, a spirit of humility, and a desire for repentance and growth in righteousness. Revival invigorates and sometimes deepens a believer's faith, opening his or her eyes to the truth in a fresh new way. Once again, that's two sources pointing revival is a reawakening. It's those who are saved, but they become stagnant. They, they, there's just a coldness and an apathy and they need to be revived. Those are two definitions of revival. So for today's focus, I want you to focus on revival, but we're going to do so hopefully in an interesting way. And hopefully you will. Now remember today's focus is where I just hand you I hand it to you. I just place it. Here's what I want you to go focus on. You've got to do a little bit of the work. All right. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to turn your attention to the 1940s. The 1940s and the revival on the Isle of Lewis. The revival on the Isle of Lewis. I know literally nothing about this. I I know literally nothing about the revival on the Isle of Lewis. If you were to ask me, I mean, I think I'm very knowledgeable about church history. 
not obviously super knowledgeable about 1940s, okay? Or maybe I'm knowledgeable about the 1940s, but somehow I miss the revival on the Isle of Lewis. I, I, I don't know anything about it. What happened is the other day, I purchased two books, two books from sermonaudio.com, two books, Breath from Heaven, How Ref- how Revival Shaped Our Past and Should Change Our Present. Breath from Heaven, How Revival Shaped Our Past and Should Change Our Present and The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. I ordered it from sermonaudio.com. It had arrived like two days later. They got these books to me quick. All right. So I grabbed Breath from Heaven. I know The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. I've read it who knows how many times. I just don't know where my other copy was. I'm like, well, I'm ordering Breath from Heaven. They've got The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer in, in the store. I'll just buy both, right? But obviously, what the first one I wanted to get was, the first one I wanted to open up was Breath from Heaven, um, How Revival Shaped Our Past and Should Change Our Present. So I opened it up, and it gives me the contents, the prototype, the prototype of revival, uh, the promise of revival, the past of revival, the prayer of revival, the prevention of revival, the partnership of revival, the president of revival, the patience in revival, the product, product of revival, the praise of revival. Earnest call to follow good men, the life of James Calder, how to the prayer meeting, right? So I'm like, okay, that's good. They offer an introduction here. All right, interesting. Okay, I started reading a little bit about the introduction. Didn't spend a lot of time focusing on it. Then I went section one, sermons on revival. This section contains a series of sermons on the topic of revival preached during the summer of 2016. All right, I turned the page. The prototype of revival. I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to read. All right. The first thing they quote, Genesis 4, 25 through 26. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said, she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And, and to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Genesis 4, 25 through 26. Now, first I stop and go, that's an interesting place to start. So are they associating with revival is when men begin to call upon the name of the Lord. That if revival happens, people will begin to call upon the name of the Lord instead of ignoring the Lord. Instead of being apathetic towards the Lord that will call. Okay, maybe that's the direction they're going. I was just trying to process it. I'm like, okay, that's enough. I don't think if I was going to start uh, with something on revival, I'd start in Genesis. But that, hey, that's interesting. Got my attention. Okay. So then I started reading. If you have ever seen revival advertised, it is evidence that people do not know what revival is. All right, stop right there. They make an argument. Hey, if you've ever seen a revival advertised, the people there don't have a clue what it is. Well, I've seen that over and over and over in my life. Hey, the fall revival, the summer revival, we're having a revival. If it's advertised, they say they don't know what it is. They go on. Revival meetings, revival weeks, revival services have nothing to do with revival. An evangelistic campaign is not revival. Nor is a conference or a special season of prayer. So it it starts by telling you all the things revival isn't. Let me go through this again. Um, revival meetings, revival weeks, revival services have nothing to do with revival. An evangelistic campaign is not revival, nor is a conference or a special season of prayer. That's not revival, right? So then when we speak of revival, this is how they define it, we refer to a sovereign act of God that breathes spiritual life into an area. Oh, I'm like, okay, that that got my attention. Revival is a sovereign. Let me read it to you again. Is a sovereign act of God that breathes spiritual life into an area. So you have an area. There's obviously Christians who have fallen into this 
apathy, complacency, stagnation, dormancy. They, they, they've fallen into this. And now God sovereignly moves on that area, those individuals, and boom, they're reawakened. And now they return to their first love. They have a passion and zeal for the things of God, a conviction of sin, and a desire for holiness. But note, it's a sovereign act of God. You can't manufacture it. You cannot make it happen. Now, this raises deep philosophical questions. If it's a sovereign act of God, then why doesn't God just revive the entire church and then everything would be better? But when it comes to the sovereign acts of God, they never go according to what we want and they almost from our perspective never make any sense. But that's a whole different sermon. But but here we go. We're like, but what about the Isle of Lewis? Where does that come into play? Here we go. Duncan Campbell, Duncan Campbell said, I quote, a revival is a community saturated with God. Duncan Campbell stated a revival is a community saturated with God. This same man, Duncan Campbell, saw God move in extraordinary ways not the least of which was the Isle of Lewis revival in the late 1940s. Now, as as soon as I read that, I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How do I not know about this? How do I not know about the Isle of Lewis revival? And then the book goes on to say, I encourage you to listen to the audio recording of him retelling his experiences of the revival. And I'm like, okay, I know what I'm doing. I'm going on a search. So I started searching. Where could I find the audio of this man retelling what happened at the revival on the Isle of Lewis? Because obviously it's significant enough. It's it's It begins the book on revival. I'm like, I got, I got to find this. So I'm like, okay, where do I look? I'm like, well, you know what? I, I, I doubt it'll be there, but maybe, I mean, this book, I bought it from Sermon Audio. They have an entire site dedicated to audio. There's got to be audio then of this, of Duncan Campbell talking about the revival of the Isle of Lewis. So I went to sermonaudio.com, the Sermons 2.0 app, and I typed in Isle of Lewis and it popped up. Revival on the Isle of of Lewis. Revival on the Isle of Lewis, Reverend Duncan Campbell, right? Then it says, click here to order. Well, you can order, but what they provide here is a an audio copy of his famous eyewitness account of the Lewis revival, all right? So their description obviously is written a long time ago when I guess you could probably order because they said a CD. Maybe you can still order a CD. I don't know. I don't know who would be ordering a CD when it's right here, but okay. The revival on the Isle of Lewis. And so I looked down, I'm like, okay, it's one hour and 31 minutes. It was, the the date for it is March the 1st, 1950. All right. And then they have the revival on the Isle of Lewis, two sermons. They have two sermons here about it. So I'm like, okay, well, let me grab the audio. So here's what we're going to do. We're not going to do a full-blown review, not not even close. I'm just going to play a little bit, just going to play a little bit to kind of get you interested. And then for your today's focus, it's very simple. I want you to think about how you define revival. And then I want you to go listen to Revival on the Isle of Lewis by the Reverend Duncan Campbell on the Sermons 2.0 app or beta.sermonaudio.com wherever you you listen to audio from Sermon Audio from. And uh, listen to it. And then you'll be familiar with what happened there. And you can draw your own conclusions. I, I'm just, I'm, my own personal feelings, whenever I hear people talk about revival, I'm just going to be honest. I tend to be very jaded and very skeptical. Because I, sometimes we hear about revival, you hear about all the emotions, all the excitement, how everyone got so excited about God and they got, they started Bible studies and reading and praying and, and then, but you always find out it doesn't last that long. So if you have a revival, 
Let's say it, everyone gets excited about God for six months, even if everyone gets excited about God for a year, if it just goes away. I don't know. I don't, I don't know how I feel. I have a hard time processing the concept. It sounds like a lot of emotionalism. Sometimes it sounds like a little bit of manipulation or a little bit of, of kind of the everyone just like once it starts, everyone kind of follows along. So I like, I, 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 I tend to be very skeptical, but I, 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 I'm interested at least hearing the beginning of this. And then today I want you to go look up Revival on the Isle of Lewis. I want you to listen to it. I want you to take notes and I want you to think about it. I want you to think about revival and think about, is that, is revival, is that really the answer? Is that what we actually need? You can tell me, but here we go. Let's listen to a little bit of this. Now, this was a recording that comes from 1950. So don't expect the highest quality, but let's uh, see what we can hear. Here we go. Now, before I begin the story, I would like to say one thing, and that is that uh, I did not bring revival to Lewis. It has grieved my heart again and again to read articles about the man that brought revival to Lewis. Notices on church boards, come and hear the man that brought revival to Lewis. My dear people, it's not true. I don't carry revival about with me in my pocket. Revival broke out in Lewis sometime before I went to the island. I thank God for the privilege of being in its midst for over three years. I went uh, at the invitation of one parish minister for ten days, but God kept me there for three years. And I'm thankful to God for the privilege of perhaps in some small way leading that movement and teaching the young converts in the deep things of God. Now, having said that, I want to read you a few lines from this little book, The Louis Awakening. It will give you an idea of the desperate state of this island prior to this gracious movement. The Presbytery of Lewis met to consider the terrible drift away from the ordinances of the church, especially the drift away from the church by the young people of the island. Now here are words from a declaration that was read in all the congregations. The Presbytery affectionately plead with their people, especially with the youth of the church, to take these matters to heart and to make serious inquiry as to what must be the end should there be no repentance. My dear people, take that to heart. Should there be no repentance. And they call upon every individual as before God to examine his or her life in the light of that responsibility which pertains to us all. That happily, in the divine mercy, we may be visited with the spirit of repentance and may turn again unto the Lord, whom we have so grieved with our iniquities and waywardness. Now, again, what we're listening to is this discussion, the revival on the Isle of Lewis, 
by the Reverend Duncan Campbell. Today's focus is I want you to go look up this sermon on the Sermons 2.0 app, beta.sermonaudio.com. I want you to listen to the whole thing as he talks about this revival. But I just, once again, whenever I hear this discussion about revival, see, a lot of people heard what he just said. They're like, oh, that sounds so beautiful. Everyone was convicted about their sin. They're they're calling on people to look at their life in light of God's word, be convicted and call out to God and repent and, and turn from their sin. It all sounds so wonderful and so good. And I think for a period of time, it can look powerful. And I think it can look beautiful for a period of time. I think it can, right? It looks amazing. Everyone's convicted. Maybe people are coming to the altar. They're crying out. They're, they're weeping. Everyone's, everyone's broken over their sin. But my, my concern is to me, it creates a situation where one, it's not sustainable because nobody, because look, people are not going to be able to live in that. They, they just don't. They won't live in that state. No, no, as sensitive as you think people want to be to sin, they, they'll be sensitive to certain sin, but when inevitably they're going to go back to living their life. And guess what? And, and, and in fact, yeah, it's not sustainable because guess what? Here's the reality of it. You can get broken over your sin, and that's wonderful. You should be. You should be convicted over your sin. But here's the reality. You can be convicted, you can be broken, and you can say, I'm going to try to stop doing this. I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to be better at this. I'm, I'm going to love them more. I'm going to do this. I'm not going to be so selfish. I'm not going to be so, I'm not going to, I'm not going to speak with certain language. I'm going to think better thoughts. And, 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 and you get convicted. But the reality is, no matter how convicted, no matter how broken you are, guess what's going to happen? you're still going to continue to sin and you're going to continue to sin. So either revival creates a situation where everyone gets convicted and then they convince themselves that they're going to do all of this better, better, greater, more godly. And then weeks later, months later, they have to either continue to convince themselves that they are better, more godly than they really are, or they're going to have to continue to be very blunt and honest with themselves and realize that no matter how much revival occurred, no matter how emotional they got, no matter how much they dedicated themselves to scripture, to prayer, and to sermons, they still have sin, 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 sin in their life, in their thoughts, in their words, in their deeds, internally and externally, especially if they will compare their life to the word of God. Now, some will say, well, well, are you saying that then the revival is negative? I'm not. I'm just saying that what happens is everyone can go through that emotional upheaval and turmoil. And, and they, and I do believe everyone's motives are pure and right saying, I'm going to live for God. And they really truly believe that. And I'm going to do it. And then you find out that they realize that they, 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 at some point, the reality of life, they still have a sinful nature. They still have the flesh. They still are going to desire that their oh, inside of them is still going to want th- to serve themselves more than they want to serve God. Inside themselves, they're going to love themselves more than they love others. Inside themselves, they're going to love themselves more than God. And that reality is going to creep back up and it's going to be like, well, I went through this great revival. Now I, I'm right back to here. And then I go through another great re- time of revival and then I end up right back right here. And I think it can perpetuate a very damaging cycle. I think that's something to consider. I like that feeling. Get get everyone convicted about their sin. That's true. We all need to be convicted by our sin. We all need to be broken over our sin. But there, at the same time, there's got to be to balance it out is great. Be broken. Repent. Commit yourself to following Christ better. We should try to do that constantly. But there's also got to be another reality. And I know it seems contradictory, but the other reality is. You have a sinful nature in the flesh and you're going to continue to sin and you're going to continue to sin and you're going to continue to sin and you're going to see the evidence of that sin and your thinking and your speaking and your desires and your feelings and in your actions. Let's see what else he he said in 1950. Here we go. Especially would they warn their young people of the devil's man traps, the cinema and the public house. That was a declaration by the presbytery read in all the congregations. Please note, and warning the young people of Satan's traps, the cinema, the cinema. Now, 
the point is, whenever there's this call for revival, it's almost like a call for revival. Now compare your life to this. Do you go to the cinema? I don't know what the public house was. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it's a pub. I don't know what it was, but there, whatever it was, hey, are you doing these things? Are you, well, almost inevitably, you're going to be able to convince people, hey, I'm, you know what? I want to go to the cinema. I want to do this. I'm doing this for fun and this for entertainment. I love entertainment. And you can bring great conviction. The only problem is then, then everyone gets broken. They, they want it. And then I, I think you create a cycle, but you, you can tell me your thoughts on revival. Let, let's, let's let this play just a little bit more. And published in the local press. Now you might ask me, What do you mean by revival? There are a great many views held by people today as to what revival is. So you hear men say, are you going out to the revival meetings? We're having a revival crusade. And so on. There is a world of difference between a crusade or a special effort in the field of evangelism. My dear people, that is not revival. As I already said from this platform, I thank God for every soul brought to Christ through our special effort and for every season of blessing at our conferences and at our conventions. We praise God for such movements. But is it not true that such movements do not, as a general rule, touch the community? The community remains more or less the same and the masses go past us to hell. But in revival, the community suddenly becomes conscious of the movings of God beginning among his own people. So that in a matter of hours, not days, In a matter of hours, churches become crowded. No intimation of any special meeting, but something happening that moves men and women to the house of God. And you find within hours, scores of men and women crying to God for mercy before they went near a church. Now, he's putting revival more, when revival happens, the community is so impacted by God that then they pour into the church. They pour into the church. So, if revival is more, it would be about the people in the church, not the people outside. Once again, the focus flips to the people outside the church. Now, is this the believers who left? Uh, maybe this is what he's referencing. These are the believers who have fallen into this great state of, you know, stagnation, apathy. They, they are just dormant. They, they're just something is wrong. And then all of a sudden, God sovereignly acts, revival breaks out in the area, and all of a sudden these people are reawakened and they pour to the church to cry out to God for their stagnant, dormant spiritual state. That, that I think fits a little bit better with what he's saying. He's not articulating it specifically, but that's what he's saying. We'll play just a little bit more. Again, today's focus is only supposed to be 15 minutes. I just wanted to bring, I want to, I want to point you in this direction. Again, it's called the revival on the Isle of Lewis. It's, it was, uh, uh, preached in 1950, March 1st, 1950. It talks about the, the famous revival on the Isle of Lewis that happened in the late 40s. And you should go listen to it today. Make that your focus today. Listen to it. Everyone talks about revival, 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 at least here an eyewitness account of, well, this revival. And you can tell me what you think. Here's just a little bit more from this message. You have read the history of revivals. 
the Jonathan Edward revival in America. That was what happened. Uh, the Welsh revival, that is what happened. And uh, the more recent Lewis revival, that is what happened. When God stepped down, suddenly, men and women all over the parish were gripped by the fear of God. Now, how did it happen? This, to me, is an interesting story, and I want to tell it in full. And you're going to have to go listen to it. It's an interesting story that he wants to tell in full. You go listen to it again. Sermons 2.0 app. Sermons 2.0 app. Beta.sermonaudio.com, the beta uh, website for Sermon Audio. Look up Revival on the Isle of Lewis, the Reverend Duncan Campbell, as he tells what happened. And you can, you can look, do your own, how do you define revival? Well, how do you understand it? Do you see, maybe you agree with my kind of being jaded and cynical, how it kind of creates this like, yeah, okay, I'm revived. Oh, I'm, I'm guilty before God. Okay, I need to do something. Yes, I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to go to church more. I'm going to stop sinning. I'm going to do it. And then you realize, guess what? That you're still going to sin. You're still going to sin. And that can lead to either now you have to put on a robe of self-righteousness and pretend to be something you're not, or you start becoming weary and tired that, you can go through a revival, get all excited, go right back, get weird, get excited, get all convicted, go right back. And it's a perpetual state that can lead to discouragement and despair. I'm not saying we shouldn't see, we shouldn't want revival, but I just, I just thought if it's a sovereign act of God, here's always my struggle. If it's a sovereign act of God to revive his people, why does it not last? So many times when you go to a place where there was supposedly great revival and you go back and you try to find all the people that were involved in it, many of the people never, not even going back to church. They're not, they're not in church anymore. Many of them don't even claim to be Christians anymore. I mean, I've, I've seen lots of so-called revivals and then you go try to find all the people who talked about it and talked about it. They're, they're, where are they? Where are they? So I don't know. I don't know. You can email me your thoughts. News, if at yahoo.com. News, if at yahoo.com. That's news, if at yahoo.com. Your today's focus is the revival on the Isle of Lewis. I want you to go download the Sermons 2.0 app or go to beta.sermonaudio.com. Look up the revival of the Isle of Lewis by the Reverend Duncan Campbell and listen to his eyewitness account of what happened in the late 1940s. And I hope as you listen, you'll be blessed by it and hopefully you have benefited from this today's focus for this Wednesday, October the 18th, 2023. Let's do that again. 